today we have Ashley Town. She's a director, fraud service for the Co-op Financial Services, a provider of payments and financial technology to credit unions. Ashley has been with the Co-op since July 2015. Prior to then, she worked at First Data Corp for four years as a product manager and fraud and risk service analyst. Ashley began her career as a bank teller for one year with Great Western Bank. Ashley holds an MBA from Bellevue University in Bellevue, Nebraska. And today, Ashley will be talking to us about card skimming. And thank you, Ashley. Thanks, Christine. Thank you for having me. I love any opportunity to come on and talk to, to fellow people about fraud. I think it's such an interesting topic. It's always changing. Yes. It is. Um, and it's always exciting, <laughs> exciting stuff. So, so thank you. Um, so wanted to touch um, a little bit on what we've been seeing at Co-op as fraud has been changing uh, really over the last few months since the start of January. 2020 has been such an odd year um, for everybody in the industry. And especially when we're looking at fraud, we are seeing not only our consumer habits changing, but we're certainly seeing the habits of fraudsters adjust. Um, so, so what we've been doing at co-op, we've been looking at where our fraud trends have been taking place since January 2020. Um, and you'll notice a couple of things on this presentation. The first is one of the big leaders when it comes to fraud and where we see the most impact for fraud right now is in money transfers and P2P transactions. So this is your um, transactions like Venmo, um, Zelle, Cash App, um, any of those types of merchants has really been a strong leader when it comes to fraud. And we've seen our fraudsters really change their tactics into this avenue and channel for activity. Um, probably something else you'll notice on this um, slide is that in April and May, um, right after we started to see COVID really take hold, and um, we saw electronic stores um, spike significantly. Um, most of this was due to BestBuyOnline.com, um, where I'm sure many of the listeners on the call have also seen this type of activity where we got hammered with Best Buy transactions. And what was interesting about Best Buy is we really found that fraudsters tried to emulate where they see valid transactions occurring. So while you probably saw a lot of um, valid consumers looking to make transactions um, where they um, make valid transactions where they're trying to go to a remote um, processing, um, remote work from home. And we also saw fraudsters take this avenue of understanding that that's where consumers merchant transactions were changing. Um, and so they tried to emulate that as well. So a lot of fraud at, at Best Buy. But what we're really going to focus on today is money transfer in P2P transactions. So money transfer in P2P transactions, as I mentioned, has always been a strong leader um, in our fraud space. So certainly saw it as the number one merchant of fraud. Uh, you'll see 4829 on here. Uh, what we saw in January, it's always kind of been in that first or second place, um, but we saw a lot of schemes come out of COVID um, specific to this activity. So when we look at P2P and money transfer fraud, the first thing that we've really started to see is a spike in just transaction usage and fraud um, occurring between 2016 and 2019. And 2016 is when we really started to see this transition for um, consumers to start using the activity. Uh, we also saw that this was about the time that many of our financial institutions and merchants started to move over to, from um, a card environment where you're swiping your transactions to EMV. So it also caused the place where fraudsters were forced to shift their types of transactions. Now, when we look at the activity that was experienced in 2020, we saw a significant growth um, between January to April and May of where P2P and money transfer fraud occurred. So uh, just in the Q1, when we look at January to March, April had a 39% increase in fraud in this arena. And then May in particular had a 64% increase. Um, when we looked at the type of fraud that we were experiencing, a majority of the activity was coming from Cash App. And I think it's important to note, there's a lot of P2P and money transfer um, 
types of merchants that are out there in the market. So Cash App just happens to be where we've seen significant growth right now. Um, Venmo um, also has been a contributor. Uh, you'll see other merchants like Apple and PayPal and Facebook kind of play in that space. But significantly what we've seen with most of our credit unions has been that increase in activity within Cash App and Venmo. Um, and usually the transactions that were experienced average about $87 um, per um, incident. So I uh, certainly saw a lot of impact in this space. Now, one of the ways that we saw P2P transactions really be utilized is specifically with state unemployment scams. So this really hit the United States pretty hard um, right around the June, going into a bit of July timeframe. Um, what we saw is there was an international criminal ring that started to submit uh, fraudulent state unemployment claims uh, across the U.S. We saw a lot of um, activity out of Washington and um, certainly out of Michigan um, where we saw a huge increase of these claims. But what happened is so once they would find they would submit the fraudulent unemployment claim, that money would get deposited into an account. And usually that account had no connection, no ties to the claim for the unemployment. So if I had um, a fraudulent claim for uh, Joe Smith, the money would get transferred into Bob Brown's account. So there was no connection really tying the two together. Um, and then what would happen is Bob Brown uh, would then transfer that money using a P2P transaction. So they would essentially launder the money and it would go through this a couple of times where um, it would go to a couple of different institutions until it finally um, hit the account of, you know, the ringleader in this, this organized crime. And they would get um, the majority of the portion of the funds that were involved in the, the scam. Um, and what we found is this really involved a lot of mules working for this international crime ring. And when we say mules, a lot of times it could be, um, you know, unknowingly uh, participants. So folks that are at the credit union that think that they're falling in love and are just sending money um, abroad to their boyfriend, um, or it's somebody that is actually an active participant. So this has kind of been a fine line for our credit unions in trying to understand, you know, how how a member is participating and what their knowledge of the participation might be. Um, but essentially the way that this money is getting laundered is through the use of those P2P um, merchants and transactions. Um, <laughs> there was a lot of noise going around um, in the community around what do you do when you see or suspect this type of activity occurring. And um, the US Secret Service put out a couple of notices um, first, to report any activity that might be suspect at the local state level, but also they did provide um, access for U.S. Secret Service to be contacted in the event that um, a credit union might suspect they might have this activity occurring. What was probably even more difficult was what do you do with the mule transactions? So what we saw is a lot of our credit unions were coming to us saying, hey, we have some unusual P2P transactions. Our members are saying that they're valid, but we really don't have a way to prove the activity. Um, so what we've been recommending and what the Secret Service has recommended is to create payment hold strategies on these transactions. If you typically don't see P2P transactions from your members um, at a certain dollar amount, um, you can put hold strategies in place so that you can make sure that the deposit um, and the source of those funds are truly valid. And then also requesting proof from the source, uh, from the consumer. So we saw a lot of screenshots of the actual transactions. Um, we've also had consumers sign waivers saying that it actually is their activity, things of that nature. And, and what was really interesting in this particular scam is when our credit unions would be talking to members and asking activity, asking questions about the activity, a lot of times, again, they felt like it was valid. Maybe they felt like they were helping out a relative. They thought they were helping out, you know, their long distance boyfriend, girlfriend, um, any of those types of things. So it's really important that we were able to identify and get that proof of source from the consumer to make sure that they felt comfortable and that it, it truly was theirs. 
So why are fraudsters successful in this space? The first thing is that fraudsters have really gravitated to using P2P transactions as part of their ability to commit fraud. Um, it used to be historically they were using ACH and wire transactions. Um, however, those can take a while and fraudsters like to have that immediate relief of getting their funds instantly, um, which is something that you're able to get with a P2P transaction. So as soon as I send that money, I'm able to cash it out and take it out um, and you know do whatever I need to do with that, that money. But with ACH transactions, that might take a few days. Wire transactions um, can require manual review, multiple verifications, things of that nature that delay the process in which fraudsters get that um, actual cash and that money. And um, the other thing is that fraudsters can really monetize breached information. So especially since CHIP has been introduced into the market, that restricted an, a revenue stream that fraudsters were used to using. Now that they have targeted more of a focus on how can I get credentials stolen from different merchants and different online sources, they have, now have a manner in which they can take those funds and take that information and monetize it. So if I'm retrieving email addresses, passwords, um, mother's maiden name, social security number, all of the things really necessary to open up a Venmo account um, and commit fraud. So now you're really seeing that information that's been stolen or breached being put to use by fraudsters. And then really consumers and credit unions are still trying to figure out what P2P means to them and how to contain the fraud. And so consumers are just starting to get used to actually using this method, especially with COVID, we've seen an increase in P2P transactions for valid use. Um, in particular, because a lot of merchants are kind of pushing in that direction. There's no longer this cash exchange. Um, your small mom and pop shops are probably taking Venmo or taking Zelle. And um, so this is something that consumers are becoming more and more accustomed with, but it's still taking some time. And then as we're seeing consumers get adjusted, we're also seeing credit unions get adjusted. Um, and part of that is, you know, these are new transactions. How do we identify the ways and manners in which fraudsters are going to start using this tactic? Um, but then also, how do we stop it and prevent the activity? So there's a couple of things that we're still on the learning curve from that we're working to get adjusted and accommodate to these new trends that are emerging. So then defending against P2P fraud, what do you do? So this is what we've learned so far. The first piece is really implementing daily limits and transaction limits. Identify kind of what's normal for your cardholder base and what's not and setting limits from there. And the second piece is holding funds that you suspect um, might be unusual for your cardholder base or for your consumers and wait until they get validated. Um, require proof of transactions if you have consumers that you suspect might be a part of a scheme or part of friendly fraud. Um, again, sometimes these are um, consumers that maybe are not aware of different types of schemes or even that they're a part of a scam. We see a lot of romance scams happening right now. So it's also really important that you educate consumers on the type of fraud that you're seeing. Um, let them know, you know, you can't just send Zelle transactions to anybody, you need to make sure that it's a trusted source um, and that they are not falling victim to scams in which Zelle might be taking place as well. And then just make sure that you have a strong authentication strategy in place so that if you are validating activity with consumers, um, you have an ability to do that and feel secure about the manner in which you're authenticating the member uh, for this transaction. So a lot of different components that go into this. And I think, you know, as we continue to grow and even learn more about these trends, um, hopefully this list expands as well as our preventive measures are being identified. And that is really, um, you know, what we have to share on P2P fraud and what we're seeing in this space. But we certainly do have avenues if there's questions that come up uh, for you to reach out to co-op and we're happy to share more information. Ashley, this was really good information. I mean, I feel like a lot of times the credit unions now need to be FBI agents trying to figure out what their members are doing and if it is fraudulent or, you know, what type of scheme, because we don't want our members 
you know, going, getting hooked up into the scam and then losing all this money. And, and so it, it's, you know, really nice that um, you came here and, and you talked about different ways that credit unions could actually be prepared. Yeah, you know, I think to your point, nobody wants to go in and accuse members that they don't know what they're doing with their money or that they're a part of the scam. It's such a fine line, but especially now with all of the changes in the environment and how fraudsters are really making modifications to their tactics, yes. um, it's super alarming. And, you know, everybody's got to be on the forefront. And that's why I think member education is so important and vital so that they, they know where these scams might be coming from. Yes. No, I agree that it is important that our, we take the first step in educating our mm -hmm. members. Well, yeah, thank absolutely. you. And this is being recorded, so I will be sending it out to the credit unions and I can share it with you as well if you would like. Great. That'd be perfect. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. And I appreciate everybody attending and have a good day. Thank you.